In this video, we continue looking at methods for proteomics analyses to compare the protein profiles of samples between treatments and controls or between an organism at different stages of its life cycle, for example. In earlier videos, we looked at alternative proteomics tools, such as the use of two-dimensional gel electrophoresis with mass spectrometry, as well as isotope-coded infinity tags as a useful way of comparing protein samples between treatments and controls. Now we're going to extend out to an additional method for proteomics called shotgun proteomics. And in the process of shotgun proteomics, what is typically going to happen as an overview is that a sample of proteins from a treatment or control will be digested to cleave those into a peptide mixture, which will then be subjected to high performance liquid chromatography, followed by mass spectrometry using soft ionization techniques, as well as MS2 or tandem mass spectrometry to collect fragments of the molecular ions of those peptides, coupled with a variety of computational techniques to evaluate those MS1 and MS2 data for purposes of identifying the individual peptides that are present in those mixtures and tracing that back to what proteins they originated from. So let's take a closer look at this process of shotgun proteomics. And we call it shotgun proteomics because much like a shotgun doesn't hit a specific target, but instead fires kind of quasi randomly, the shotgun proteomics will quasi randomly look at the different proteins that are present in a particular sample. So this is a bit, a bit different than the isotope coded affinity tags that we were looking at in the last video, where the isotope coded affinity tag formed a covalent link to a specific functional group from a protein, such as forming a covalent link to a cysteine residue. And so in that case, we'd be looking at proteins that contained cysteine residues specifically. Here with the shotgun proteomics approach, we are going to be detecting whatever peptide fragments show up in our LCMS experiment. And so taking a look at the workflow of how we would go about carrying out this type of shotgun proteomics approach, I'm going to draw out a schematic of what will happen during this process and what information we will gain. So we start here with our biological sample, which I'm just going to represent as this poor attempt at drawing a tube of our biological sample a sample from whatever treatment or control organism that we desired to look at. That biological sample we would use to extract the protein mixture from, to ideally separate those proteins from other biomolecules that are ubiquitous within the cell. From there, that mixture of proteins would be digested using trypsin or some other protease, such as protease K, which is a broad spectrum protease that digests at a variety of different positions within a peptide. So we could digest with trypsin and or proteinase K, which we can recognize as a protease because it's a protein ASE, the ASE indicates an enzyme. It's an enzyme that acts upon proteins to cleave proteins. So the protein mixture is digested using one or more proteases. That's going to result in a peptide mixture. The purpose of taking that mixture of intact proteins and digesting that to yield peptides is that the peptides are going to generally be more amenable for analysis by the MS1 and MS2 techniques and more amenable to separation by liquid chromatography. So that peptide mix that results would then be subject to LCMS, liquid chromatography, mass spectrometry, using specialized chromatography columns that we recognize to be suitable for separating peptides of different chain lengths, peptides that contain different amino acids, et cetera, et cetera, to get some separation of the peptides within that mixture, to simplify out the mixture sufficiently so that once it enters the mass spectrometer, distinct mass spectra can be obtained that correspond to individual peptides. 
So at that point then, after the LC portion of this, the mass spectrometry occurs. And in that mass spectrometry experiment, typically a soft ionization technique is generally used so that molecular ions can be detected. Electrospray ionization is a very common soft ionization technique that has been widely used for the analysis of these peptide mixtures. And then additionally to that MS1 data providing evidence for the molecular ion of each individual peptide that is detected, generally MS2 or tandem mass spectrometry is, detect is executed as well so that we are evaluating not only the precursor ion or the parent ion, but we're also evaluating the product ion, the fragment ion, or the daughter ion, whatever terminology you want to refer to it as there as well, to collect an extra level of information about each peptide. At that point, once the tandem mass spectra have been established, a variety of software programs are available to interpret those data. These data are generally not interpretable just by naked eye and manual curation because there are so many proteins in a particular individual sample that it wouldn't be possible for the experimenter to go through and manually interpret these data. So interpret the MS1 and MS2 data. And that's done using a variety of different softwares that will match specific MS1 molecular ions and specific fragments with peptide sequences. Because given that there are 20 standard amino acids incorporated into these proteins, there are some diagnostic MS2 fragments that will result because the 20 standard amino acids have very specific locations where there are weak bonds or bonds that are are particularly subject to fragmentation during the MS2 experiment. And so with the software, the software can match up the mass to charge ratios of the fragments and the intact parent ion with particular peptide sequences that are hypothesized to match those. As an extra layer to this or level to this, those particular peptide sequences can also be compared computationally with databases of known proteins in order to provide further evidence about what proteins those peptide sequences originated from. Because keep in mind here that we aren't evaluating intact proteins in this experiment, but instead we're evaluating those peptide fragments. And so those peptide fragments need to be traced back to what proteins they originated from. And by computational comparison of the proposed peptide sequences, with peptide sequences that are found within known proteins, we can match up peptides with what candidate proteins they corresponded to. This can get a bit dicey when we consider things like post-translational modifications, which would alter the master charge ratio of the parent ions and the daughter ions in these individual peptides. But in many cases, we are able to link back to known proteins, particularly when we're not dealing with post-translationally modified peptides and proteins. And so this allows us a simultaneous overview of a variety of different proteins that are found within the biological sample that we started with, because generally we're going to be creating a variety of different peptides here, evaluating them, matching them up with a variety of different known proteins. So that's a key advantage to this is that it does look globally at the proteome of a particular organism. Nonetheless, there are some disadvantages to this strategy as well. So the advantage of this strategy is that it is global. It is going to be capable of looking at a variety of different proteins by looking at peptide fragments simultaneously uh, rather than targeting one specific functional group or relying upon the ability to separate proteins using 2D gel electrophoresis or things like that. Disadvantage 
is that we didn't see anything incorporated into this experiment that allowed relative quantification of protein, of specific proteins between treatments and controls. So relative quantification of specific proteins can be challenging. It is possible in some cases to incorporate internal standards into the LCMS experiment to enable some level of relative quantification of specific proteins, but more typically, this is used as a yes-no technique, a qualitative technique, meaning it will tell us whether a particular protein is present or not, but it won't allow us to quantify those between different samples. So that is a possible disadvantage of this. Additionally, the identification of completely unknown proteins can be challenging because as a key step in our workflow for this, we were generally comparing the peptides that we had evidence for based on mass spectrometry with predicted sequences from proteins that are known from the organism. In cases of less well-studied organisms, organisms that aren't typically used as model organisms, the identification of unknown proteins can be challenging because we don't know and have good understanding of what the variety of proteins produced by those organisms are. So overall, to summarize, when we think about the three main types of proteomics analyses that we have focused on in this unit, those three main types being 2D gel electrophoresis with mass spectrometry, isotope-coded infinity tags being used, and this shotgun approach. In all three cases, mass spectrometry is a key portion of that modern workflow because of the vast capabilities of mass spectrometry for analyzing proteins and peptides. In each of the three different types of proteomics experiments, we have some key advantages and disadvantages that we need to keep in mind. And in actuality, there is no one-size-fits-all proteomics experiment. Instead, different pieces of key information can be gained from these different types of proteomics experiments where a type of protein that is overlooked by one of these strategies would be detected by another and vice versa. So ultimately, the decision to conduct one of these types of experiments over the other is dependent upon exactly what type of question one is trying to address. Does the person have some idea that the protein that they are interested in should be able to be separated by 2D gel electrophoresis and is really abundant? If that's the case, then the 2D gel electrophoresis with the mass spectrometry could be the most valuable option. On the other hand, if one predicts that the protein of interest will not be able to be readily separated by 2D gel electrophoresis or that is a really low abundance protein, then this strategy of shotgun proteomics might be a more advantageous approach. So one has to keep in mind what exactly they're trying to accomplish in their proteomics experiment and what types of proteins they're particularly interested in looking at to determine what the best approach is for that particular situation.